Why don't more infant formula companies use organic, grass-fed whole milk instead of skim? Why don't more infant formula companies use the latest breast milk science? Why don't more infant formula companies run their own clinical trials? Why don't more infant formula companies use more of the proteins found in breast milk? Why don't more infant formula companies have their own factories instead of outsourcing their manufacturing? We wondered the same thing. So we made Byheart a better formula for formula. Learn more at byheart.com. And there we have it, arguably the most iconic moment in modern human history, the words spoken by Neil Armstrong, the first person to set foot on the moon 54 years ago. The mission of Apollo 11 successfully ventured to the moon and returned. Hi again, it's another episode of Astronomy Daily. You're with... Steve Dunkley from Down Under, and today we've got a mixed bag of orbital bits and pieces, including a lunar anniversary, of course, a mystery signal, and fish in space. Join us, won't you? With your host, Steve Dunkley. Oh, that's right. Astronomy Daily, and it's the 24th of July, 2023. Thanks for joining us. And with us, as always, our ever-faithful digital reporter, Hallie. What's up, Hallie? Everything as usual, Steve. Great to be back. I hope you've been keeping busy. I've been scanning the news pages for stories, and there's so much going on. Oh, what have you found out there? Well... Did you know that astronomers have discovered a weird radio signal which has been blinking on and off every 22 minutes for more than 30 years? No, I did not know that, but I'm thinking I should get the wiring in the studio checked just in case. And remember when NASA knocked that asteroid off course last year with the DART probe? Oh yes, I remember that one. It was a little fridge-sized thing. Well, it has sent dozens of boulders flying off into space, according to new photos from Hubble. Boulders, Hallie? Yes, Steve, boulders. And what else is going on? The Chinese are sending zebrafish to the Tian Gong space station for research purposes. But Hallie, what about the boulders? I know, right? How thoughtless. Those poor fish. But that's not all. Researchers have also found a galaxy with no dark matter. As if things weren't confusing enough. I don't think those zebrafish will help there either. I think you're right, Steve. OK, better hit me with the short takes, Hallie. Here goes. Our picture of cosmic evolution could be thrown into doubt by the discovery of a massive galaxy that seems to lack dark matter. Dark matter, which accounts for around 85% of the matter in the universe, seems to be absent from the galaxy NGC 1277, part of the Perseus cluster of galaxies. The galaxy, located 240 million light-years from Earth, is the first Milky Way-sized conglomeration of stars, planets, dust, and gas found to be missing dark matter. This result does not fit in with the currently accepted cosmological models, which include dark matter. The leader behind the discovery and University of La Laguna researcher Sebastian Comarin said in a statement, Dark matter is effectively invisible because it does not interact with light like the everyday matter that composes stars, planets, and us. Its presence can be inferred by its gravitational interactions, however. The existence of this shadowy substance was first posited when astronomers observed massive galaxies, rotating so fast they would fly apart if it weren't for the gravitational influence of some unseen mass holding them together. This fact resulted in scientists theorizing that all large galaxies are wrapped in an envelope of dark matter, and this has become an important assumption in the development of theories of galactic evolution. But the discovery of a galaxy that appears to have no dark matter challenges that assumption. Considered a cosmic relic, NGC 1277 is unusual among galaxies because it has had little interaction with other surrounding galaxies. The scientists behind this revelation have a few ideas about why NGC 1277 is so deficient in dark matter. One is that the gravitational interaction with the surrounding medium within the galaxy cluster in which this galaxy is situated has stripped out the dark matter, team member and University of La Laguna researcher Anna Ferreira too. 
The other is that the dark matter was driven out of the system when the galaxy formed by the merging of protogalactic fragments, which gave rise to the relic galaxy. The team isn't totally satisfied with either explanation and will, therefore, continue investigating. Last year, researchers made an intriguing discovery, a radio signal in space that switched on and off every 18 minutes. Astronomers expect to see some repeating radio signals in space, but they usually blink on and off much more quickly. The most common repeating signals come from pulsars, rotating neutron stars that emit energetic beams like lighthouses, causing them to blink on and off as they rotate towards and away from the Earth. Pulsars slow down as they get older, and their pulses become fainter until eventually, they stop producing radio waves altogether. Our unusually slow pulsar could best be explained as a magnetar, a pulsar with exceedingly complex and powerful magnetic fields that could generate radio waves for several months before stopping. Unfortunately, they detected the source using data gathered in 2018. By the time they had analyzed the data and discovered what was thought might be a magnetar it was 2020, and it was no longer producing radio waves. Without additional data, they were unable to test their magnetar theory. Our universe is vast, and so far every new phenomenon we've discovered has not been unique. Researchers knew that if they looked again, with well-designed observations, they had a good chance of finding another long-period radio source. So, they used the Murchison Wide Field Array Radio Telescope in Western Australia to scan the Milky Way galaxy every three nights, for several months. And they didn't need to wait long. Almost as soon as they started looking, they found a new source, in a different part of the sky, this time repeating every 22 minutes. At last, the moment they had been waiting for. They used every telescope they could find, across radio, X-ray, and optical light making as many observations as possible, assuming it would not be active for long. The pulses lasted 5 minutes each, with gaps of 17 minutes between. The object looked a lot like a pulsar, but spinning 1,000 times slower. Observing over three decades meant they were able to precisely time the pulses. The source is producing them like clockwork every 1,318.1957 seconds, give or take a tenth of a millisecond. The pulses contained no information, just noise across all frequencies, just like natural radio sources. Also, the energy requirements to emit a signal at all frequencies are staggering, you need to use, well, a neutron star. While it's tempting to try to explain a new phenomenon this way, it's a bit of a cop-out. It doesn't encourage researchers to keep thinking, observing and testing new ideas. It's called the Aliens of the Gaps approach. Fortunately, this source is still active, so anyone in the world can observe it. Perhaps with creative follow-up observations, and more analysis, we'll be able to solve this new cosmic mystery. When a NASA spacecraft successfully knocked an asteroid off course last year it sent dozens of boulders skittering into space, images from the Hubble telescope showed on Thursday. NASA's fridge-sized dart probe smashed into the pyramid-sized, rugby ball-shaped asteroid Dimorphos roughly 11 million kilometers, 6.8 million miles, from Earth in September last year. The spacecraft knocked the asteroid significantly off course in the first-ever such test of Earth's planetary defenses. New images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope show that the collision also sent 37 boulders, ranging from 1 meter. 3 feet to 7 meters, 22 feet, across, floating into the cosmos. They represent around 2% of the boulders that were already scattered across the surface of the loosely held together asteroid, scientists estimated in a new study. The finding suggests that possible future missions to divert life-threatening asteroids heading toward Earth could also spray off boulders, in our direction. But these particular rocks do not pose any threat to Earth, Indeed they have barely gone anywhere. They are drifting away from Dimorphos at around a kilometer, half a mile, per hour, roughly the speed a giant tortoise walks, Hubble said in a statement. The boulders are moving so slowly that the European Space Agency's HERA mission, which is due to arrive at the asteroid in late 2026 to inspect the damage, will even be able to take a look at them.
The boulder cloud will still be dispersing when Hera arrives, said David Jewett, a planetary scientist at the University of California at Los Angeles and lead author of the new study. It's like a very slowly expanding swarm of bees, he said. The spectacular observation by Hubble tells us for the first time what happens when you hit an asteroid and see material coming out, he added. The boulders are some of the faintest things ever imaged inside our solar system. The dispersal of the boulders indicates that DART left a crater roughly 50 meters, 160 feet wide on Dimorphos, according to Jewett. The whole asteroid is 170 meters across. The scientists plan to continue following the boulders to work out their trajectory and determine how exactly they launched off the surface. China is planning to send zebrafish to its space station in the future. The small fish species will be sent into orbit on China's Tiangong space station as part of research into the interaction between fish and microorganisms in a small closed ecosystem, Shanghai-based Guanxia.cn reported. The experiment will also aid research into bone loss in astronauts. Zhang Wei, assistant to the commander-in-chief of China's manned space engineering space application system, told Chinese media of the plan during a space station science and application project solicitation seminar in Beijing on July 10. Further information regarding the timeline of the experiment and its aquatic apparatus was not disclosed. It will not be the first time fish have been sent to space. NASA's Aquatic Habitat, or AQH, designed to study how microgravity impacts marine life, was sent to the International Space Station in 2012. It hosted a small school of madaka, a small freshwater fish native to Japan. Zebrafish, or Danio Ririo, were earlier sent to the Soviet Union Salyut 5 space station in 1976 aboard the Soyuz 21 mission. Soviet cosmonauts conducting experiments with the fish found that the zebrafish appeared to modify some of their behaviors in response to living in microgravity. Sending animals to space meanwhile dates back to 1947, before the Soviet space dog Leica took her much more famous flight on Sputnik 2 in 1957. Leica tragically overheated and died just hours into her flight. Steve, if you do a fish and chips joke I'll never speak to you again. Hallie, the thought never occurred to me, I promise. Good, and that's the short takes for today. Over to you in the studio. Roger that control, we're listening to Astronomy Daily, the podcast. Thanks, Hallie. There were some really good stories there. I really appreciate you going to all that trouble. Uh, and yes, uh, at the top of the um, podcast, we did mention that it's the 54th anniversary of the Apollo 11 launch and mission to the moon with uh, Neil Armstrong, Edward Buzz Aldrin and Mike Collins, uh, who were real heroes of mine when I was a kid. I was only, uh, well, quite young. So you were just a young pup when the Apollo 11 mission launched to the moon? Well, yes, I was six years old, actually, and I remember watching it uh, in our school uh, assembly hall, uh, which was our kindergarten room, a big, big open room. And then I went home and uh, watched it at home with Dad uh, after he got home from work. And we watched it all the way until it was bedtime. <laughs> and I was only six years old, but I remember that like it was yesterday. It was one of the most monumental times of my life. And, of course, we collected all of the toys uh, out of the uh, breakfast cereal boxes. There were uh, the Lunar Module and the Command Module and the Saturn V ra rocket and uh, little uh, astronauts. And uh, I don't think we ever got an astronaut, but, uh, but we got all of the other toys. And if you cut out the back of the cereal boxes, you could uh, make a diorama of the moon. And it was my job to colour all of that in, of course, because I was the artist. So, listeners, if you have memories of the Apollo 11 moon mission, you might like to go to the Space Nuts podcast group, which is a Facebook page that uh, we all share with Space Nuts, our parent podcast with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson, and share your memories of those days. 1969, it was, 54 years ago when Apollo 11 went to the moon. 
And on Friday, Amazon has announced that it will invest $120 million to build a satellite construction facility at Kennedy Space Centre, that's the NASA Space Centre, as part of its plans to launch a space internet service to rival SpaceX's Starlink. The company founded by Jeff Bezos says the Project Kuiper will provide fast, affordable broadband to unserved and underserved communities around the world with a constellation of more than 3,200 satellites in low Earth orbit. We have an ambitious plan to begin Project Kuiper's full-scale production launches and early customer pilots next year, and this new facility will play a critical role, said Steve Metayer, Vice President of Kuiper Production Operations. The company has yet another production facility in Kirkland, Washington, where it will begin operations by the end of this year. The units will be then sent to Florida to carry out final preparations and integrate them with rockets from Blue Origin, also founded by Bezos, the United Launch Alliance, ULA, ahead of launch. Elon Musk's SpaceX launched the first batch of its more than 3,700 operational Starlink satellites in 2019 and is by far the biggest player. London headquarters OneWeb is another early entrant in the emerging sector. But governments are also keen to join the rush. China plans to launch 13,000 satellites as part of its Guowang constellation, while Canada's Telesat will add 300 and German startup Rivada is on. 600. That will be in addition to European Union's IRIS project, 170 satellites, and the 300 to 500 satellites planned to be launched by the US Military Space Development Agency. Oh, well, we've had a bit of fun today and uh, looking forward to hearing from you with your thoughts of Apollo 11 and all the other stories that we've covered today. Uh, Thank you very much, Hallie, for joining us as well. You're always uh, combing the ether for lots of interesting uh, tidbits and uh, short takes. And as always, a reminder to uh, head over to bytes.com or spacenuts.com dot io to catch all the past episodes of space nuts with andrew dunkley and professor fred watson or astronomy daily with tim gibbs in england and steve dunkley in australia so yes we are a truly international podcast team and always hallie going in between us all so yes quite a team all right see you next time on astronomy daily bye everybody what do you say hallie see you later alligator (laughs) in a while crocodile Astronomy Daily, the podcast, with your host, Steve Dunkley.